All right, hey everyone, thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Samir Sood. I'm the co-founder and director of Synapse here at SOM. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Beth Haynes of the Benjamin Rush Institute. Uh, she's sponsoring this event with us. For those of you who don't know, Synapse was created about a year ago, last November, by a group of students um, looking to embrace the power we had as first years, mere first years, uh, to make changes in our immediate environment. Um, since then, Synapse has evolved to have three main goals. First, to inform ourselves and fellow med students of issues in healthcare and medicine. Next, to seek out inspiring individuals like our panelists here. And finally, to learn how to innovate, create, and solve problems now as med students and in the future as physicians. Tonight highlights uh, the inform aspect of Synapse, uh, and I think the most important aspect in that it's the foundation of what can one day be innovation and change. Uh, this is an educational experience you won't get in the classroom or uh, won't be tested on the boards, but healthcare reform is such a vital topic uh, that will affect us as physicians and how we deliver care to our patients and as future patients ourselves and how we receive care. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time out of your evenings to uh, learn and grow and experience this uh, bigger picture with us tonight. And thank you to our panelists for coming out, um, taking time out of your evenings to share your experiences, <clears throat> your knowledge, and your often underrepresented opinions that we don't normally hear about. Um, the point of tonight is to have an open discussion. This is an open forum where your questions, your comments, your agreements, and your disagreements are all encouraged. So please, at any point, we're going to have microphones here, and that aisle. Come up, line up, ask your questions, let your voice be heard. The hope is that by hearing all sides of the story with open minds, that you create and form your own opinions so that one day you can create your own solutions. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce uh, our panelists this evening. Uh, turn off your phones, or keep them on silent like I would. And um, so first, uh, we have Dr. Beth Haynes. She's the executive director of the Benjamin Rush Institute, like I mentioned. And she has been an emergency physician for the past 20 years. Next, we have Dr. Alita Eck, founder of the Zarafath Free Health Clinic and a recent US Senate candidate for New Jersey. And she works in internal medicine. Next, we have Dr. William Thar, who is a primary care and public health doctor. He's the past medical director of rural health programs and directed epidemiology programs. Next, Dr. Marty, Martin Levine, uh, the immediate past president of the AOA and the uh, NJOPS organization. And he's the associate dean and professor at Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine. Lastly, we have Dr. Saurabh Jha, uh, an associate professor of radiology at the University of Pennsylvania. And finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Linda Boyd, who will be our moderator tonight. She will uh, present a small presentation on the history of healthcare and uh, begin the debate. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And I just want to second uh, Samir's thanks to everybody for coming, our panelists for presenting, and especially for the Benjamin Rush Institute for supporting this program. I think it's an important part of our education here. Um, the students asked me to put together a very short presentation about a really 20,000 foot view of the timeline of healthcare reform. So uh, this is going to be very brief, and I'm just going to walk you through some of the major milestones in healthcare that have occurred in the United States. So remember back in the beginning, doctors would care for patients and they would be paid either in money or sometimes in barter, corn, uh, produce, whatever uh, farmers had or things like that. And then back in the, 19, in the early 1900s when industrialization was increasing, the employers in the United States started offering something called sickness insurance, which is what it was called back then. And it's interesting that this timeline was um, in other countries, in other industrialized countries, this was when um, single-payer plans were starting to be uh, offered, but in the U.S. we went more of an employer-based program. During the 20s, uh, actually it was in the 30s, but because of the Great Depression, people weren't able to pay for health insurance and health care as much because of financial problems. And then, of course, Social Security was started. It was actually interesting to me. I hadn't realized that a publicly funded health care program was included in the original Social Security legislation, but it was taken out because of the political opposition. So. Um, 
that was something that was interesting to me. Then in the 1940s, we started with uh, private insurance plans, first starting with the hospital plans. The original one was Blue Cross, which still, which still is the major player in the United States and continues today. And there's many other private models around as well. And then physician groups came in, and that was Blue Shield, uh, again, still in place today with many other companies such as Aetna United and so forth. Um, typically, insurance was sold to employers who offered them to employees, and there was some kind of splitting of that payment, whether the employer paid all of it and the employee paid part, or um, there was some kind of differential, and that continues today in, um, in many large companies. Then in the 1960s, um, Lyndon Johnson introduced, it was actually 1965 when it was signed into legislation, Medicare, which was a government-funded plan insurance, health insurance for Americans over 65. Um, in 1972, that was actually expanded to include people who had severe disabilities and also for people with end-stage renal disease so that they could afford dialysis as technology improved. Medicaid was also part of that uh, landmark legislation in 1965, and that was insurance for the poor who fell below a certain level of the federal poverty level, and that level has changed over the years. And it's state administered, but federally supported. In the 1990s, actually started in the late 80s, and the movement towards managed care started, you know, even as late as, as early as in the 70s, but um, really came into the forefront in, in practice in the 1990s. And what managed care was, was uh, primary care doctors actually became the centerpiece of care for patients, where um, they were termed the gatekeeper, which I still haven't met a doctor who likes that term to be called, but. Um, the PCP was the primary care doctor or, or provider managed the care by trying to limit referrals, tests, and hospitalizations. And it did result in lower utilization and somewhat reduced costs, but patients really revolted as the uh, penetration of managed care increased, started in the West Coast and got very large penetration as it started to move across the country. There was a big revolt of patients where they wanted more choice and they didn't want to have those kinds of limits. And um, so managed care came down, was not as prevalent as, is certainly still around, but not as prevalent as it was back in the 90s. In the 2000s, under George Bush, um, we had the Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act, and that was something that actually took a lot of work to get done, and it provided, um, and still provides, drugs for a drug plan for the elderly and disabled. And where are we today? Of course, we're going to be talking about the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, ACA, as many of you hear about it. But you know, where are we in health care and why are we even talking about this tonight? Why do we care about health care reform? I'm just going to show you a couple of slides about where health care in America is today. The expenditures in, in um, the United States are the highest of all industrial countries. We pay, uh, spend over $7,500 per capita, meaning per person, in the United States on health care. And you can see where we stand in orange compared to other industrialized countries. And this is the same numbers, but you can see that we've been growing as all countries have been growing in their health care costs as medicine has become more uh, higher in technology and more costly. But we are growing much higher and a much faster rate than other countries. We have 48 million people uninsured as of last year, and that's a high number. And it's interesting to find a lot of people think that the uninsured are the people who are unemployed, and that's not the case. The majority of people who are uninsured actually have a job, but their job either doesn't provide insurance or the patient can't afford to pay their share of the insurance. So. Um, it, it, that is a, a continuing problem that we address here. And our quality, what do we get for all this money that we're spending? Our quality indices show that we're ranked, in 2000 we were ranked 37th by the World Health Organization of countries. And just last, uh, this year, uh, the Institute of Medicine and the National Research Council put out a study to look at where we rank, and out of 17 developed countries, we ranked 17th. 
So this is what we get for our, our um, financial input. So we definitely have work to do. And here are some things where, in terms of our rankings, um, highest teenage pregnancy rate, highest rate of women dying due to complications due to, preg to childbirth, um, highest rate of death by car accident. Obviously, some of these things are not necessarily related to health care or the health insurance system, but related to patient behavior. But they're all health indices that we need to care about as physicians and something that we have to address. So that's where it takes us to today, tonight, to our panel and to our um, discussion. So it's clear that we have work to do and let's get started on how that can happen. So what we're gonna to do tonight, the format is, is that each of our panelists is going to have five minutes to present their case for their proposal of how to change and improve healthcare in the United States. And after they're done, all of you will have an opportunity to ask questions, and each of the respondents of the panelists will be able to respond if they have something that they think is pertinent for that particular question. So I encourage you, as you're listening to each of the panelists, to write down questions, and this is gonna be a lot of fun if we have a very robust discussion as the evening goes on. So with that, we're gonna start with Dr. Um, Haynes. Well, thank you so much. Is this on? Are you guys hearing? Okay. Um, one of the things that I think is really important as we all try to better understand the issue of health care reform is to be really careful about just the, the fact that there is a thing called confirmation bias. And it's something that I work very hard for myself. One of my favorite blogs that I read is The Incidental Economist. And I like to read them because they do very good research and I disagree with most of their interpretations of the research. But I need to understand what, you know, the best case against what I believe in in order to make sure that I'm right. And if I get, get some information that says I'm wrong about something, I hope I have the, the integrity to be able to change my mind. Just because you hear something frequently doesn't mean that it's true. And one of the things that I, I would caution you to go look at is what is the validity of the World Health Organization study that ranks the United States as 37th? This is a, uh, has been highly criticized in peer-reviewed literature as an inadequate study. 80% of the data that is quoted in there is, has been imputed this means that they didn't have actual data or statistics, but they would take an area of the world, and because they were missing data, they would make the best possible guess based on similar areas. So this, this is sort of the source of the data. You need to look at the primary sources, where are they getting their data, and understand statistics, and how those statistics are being applied. One of, one of the most frequent um, criticisms of the United States has been its high infant mortality rate compared to other countries. They're not comparing apples and oranges. And I'm just giving you two instances here and, and just to give you a clue of why you have to really get into that primary literature and look at what you're hearing and don't just take it at face value. Other countries consider an infant death by different de definitions. Sometimes it's how long an infant is. Infants 30 centimeters or less aren't considered a live birth. If they don't live beyond the first 24 hours, they're not a live birth. If they're born at less than 28 weeks of gestation, they are not a live birth. In con and this is in contrast to the United States that if it's born and it has a heartbeat, it's considered a live birth. So our infant mortality rates are are very hard, are skewed because it's not apples to oranges. And if you then think that you have these higher degree of, of very young deaths being put into the statistics, that will also drag down our life expectancy. So you've got to look at, at those facts and really examine them carefully. I very, very strongly support a free market and free market solutions to the challenges that we have in healthcare. And I do that not out of trying to support business, but I do it because for, free, for me, the, what is most important about free markets is not the market, but freedom. And I think that free market, markets emanate from 
that belief in the dignity of each individual human being as an individual being treated absolutely equally. There's no special interest groups. You're not allowed to lie, cheat, steal, have fraud, or get special favors from the government in a free market. Those are mixed economies that allow those things. And throughout the whole world, there is no purely free market system. And before the ACA came, it, we were not a free market. The United States has not had a free market system ever. The closest we came was in 1860. And ever since then, we've had increasing government involvement, of which Dr. Boyd has um, given you some big clues as to some of the major efforts of that. All the systems in the world that the United States are compared to have a mix of free market and government. But because of this confirmation bias, and perhaps on our, my side as well, but the, when somebody's arguing in favor of more government involvement in healthcare, they're crediting all the successes of these mixed systems to government involvement, and they're blaming all the problems on the free market. And I would argue there's very good economic and actually um, evidence-based reasons to, to argue it's completely flipped the other way. So I would like to live, it, the more important question than, than what kind of healthcare is what kind of country do we want to live in? And that's all, what kind of society, what kind of community? That's also why I support the free market. Because I want to be part of a, of a, of a system that is based on voluntary interaction, not one that uses political power to give to take advantage of some people over the other. Thank you, Dr. Haynes. Dr. Eck? Thank you. When I look at this, uh, this title of this, Do We Need to Reform the Reform? I think every one of us are going to uh, be on the same side of the question. It's just a matter of degree, especially since the way these exchanges have started to roll out. It's just not working very well. Something needs to change. I'm a physician in private practice, internal medicine, and I also operate a non-government free clinic 10 miles away where I donate my services to care for the poor. In my practice, I'm not a provider for any insurance company and I don't, my practice is not owned by any hospital because I want there, nothing to get in between the relationship between the patient and myself. I don't want to be um, clouded in my judgment of how I care for patients. Healthcare is very personal. People are not machines that can be programmed, and um, they're very complicated human beings with past experiences and genetics and personalities, fears, upbringing, the way they think, and that makes my role as a primary care physician very challenging. People make decisions every day that I can't control. Uh, we'll have a diabetic who refuses to follow any diet. We'll have a heart patient that just can't give up smoking. We'll have a patient who is um, a hypertensive refuses to take his medicine. These people are harder to treat, but I am determined to do my best. And as I develop a relationship with them, I can do better. Now, the government would like to claim that the worth of a physician depends on the patient's blood sugar, the pulmonary function, the blood pressure, and I reject that as um, criteria because they're making me responsible for things I really can't control. When I graduated from medical school, I'll never forget the wise advice of one of the um, professors. He said, the art of medicine is as important as the science. And he says, you know, you could take um, three jars of pills, blue pills and red pills and yellow pills. And in the beginning, what you would do, a person comes in with a complaint and you listen very carefully, do an exam, make sure there's nothing he's gonna die of, just give him the red pills and then tell him to come back. And maybe in a couple weeks he'll come back and you listen again, you examine him, you talk to him, and then give him the, the blue pills. And then after that, bring him back and bring him the yellow pills. And by then, he's gonna thank you so much for help making him get better. And 70% of people will get better, despite all of, our, of what we do. A lot of what we do is the art of medicine. But this requires having a relationship with a physician. It does not require a meaningful use of EMR and electronic prescribing. It doesn't require voluminous notes done for reimbursement um, purposes that where the important points tend to be lost in the verbiage. It does ask for a certain trust where the patient knows he can return if symptoms change. And it does require that private conversation not be transmitted to the government. <coughs> 
Um, people who have worked in our free clinic that we have know that we spend time with these people. We find out what their real struggles are. And a lot of times they're sick for reasons that um, are their own fault. They make bad decisions. They have bad relationships with other people. And uh, we give them medicines for their blood pressure. And the reason why they take the medicine is because they've learned to trust us. They are so grateful to us because they know we're donating our time. And that's the beauty of non-government community charity. But Obam Obamacare is not about the good health of my patients. And it's not about providing affordable medical care. And there's no way to assure that once an Obama card is given to somebody because they paid for it, that they're going to be able to find a doctor that takes it. The government is no different from all these other governments that want to wield power and control over the people. Well, I've seen the waste in the government clinics that um, the federally qualified health centers, um, they provide adequate care, but at much, much too high a cost to the taxpayers. It costs 10 times more for those people, uh, those clinics to provide the care than in our clinic. And we are told that we have, um, we need Obamacare to help the 60 million had no insurance. But Obamacare is actually going to make things worse. Did you know that in uh, January, there's 19 million people who are going to be told that their insurance is no longer available because it doesn't fit the, the criteria that Obamacare has um, prescribed. We're going to have more uninsured people. And it also depends on the expansion of Medicaid, which is an undeniably failed program. It provides so little payment and so much paperwork to the doctors that most doctors don't take it. And so there's, the people are actually referred to our clinic people with um, uh, Medicaid because they complain to the Medicaid office they can't find a doctor. It's a huge waste of taxpayer dollars to give $5,000 to a Medicaid HMO for every healthy new enrollee. If a poor person doesn't need any medical care in a given year, why should the taxpayers pay anything for his care? So these are the questions. We have the rising cost of health care, the large number of uninsured, and if I get a chance, I'll talk to you a little bit about how um, we can provide care at so much um, lower cost, get the community involved, and we're working on a law here in New Jersey whereby we will get malpractice protection in our private practices if we donate four hours a week to care for the poor at no cost to the taxpayers. This is real compassion. The Affordable Care Act is not. Thank you, Dr. Eck. Dr. Thar? Thank you. And it's really good to see so many uh, young faces um, in the audience. Uh, this is really important because this is uh, the environment you're going to go into in just a few years. So listen closely, make decisions, and then make your own future in healthcare. Really, I want to say three simple things about where we need to go in healthcare. First of all, we have to understand that um, healthcare has to be humane. That means it is a right, a universal right to have access to healthcare. That probably wasn't true in Benjamin Rush's day. Uh, doctors killed as many people as they saved back then. But now we know that healthcare can improve the general health of populations, it uh, decreases morbidity, and can really have a, a drastic effect on the productivity and um, health of a population. So human <clears throat> health care is a right. In the United States, we're one of the only nations in the developed world that does not recognize health care as a right. We recognize it as a responsibility, for individuals. Secondly, any healthcare system needs to be simple. We live in a mess of healthcare systems and non-systems uh, competing uh, with each other and uh, uh, other interests. Um, many countries have decided, you know, to simplify their systems greatly uh, with uniform fee schedules a simple uh, reimbursement uh, system that is uniform for everyone. Uh, those kinds of things make a system understandable and accessible. Thirdly, the system has to be economical. This is, uh, we've heard quite a bit about the waste that goes on in our system. Um, we spend about a third of our money uh, just with overhead costs in our current system. Um, over 20 studies have shown that if we simplify our systems, 
go to a Medicare type uh, uh, system for all uh, citizens, we can essentially cover everyone at a higher level and not pay a penny extra. We'll actually save money uh, given that system. The system, um, again, needs to be humane, cover everyone, it needs to be simple, uh, so it's understandable, and it needs to be economical and not complex. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. I uh, want to thank Synapse for convincing me that I should be here. <laughs> uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is, uh, is an interesting uh, piece of legislation, has a lot of regulations, and it's been in effect since 2010. One of the things it uh, did was it automatically in 2010 gave the people that were unable to get insurance because of pre-existing conditions affordable insurance. Those were children with congenital anomalies, those were adults with diabetes and hypertension, those were people that had been turned down. Now, the name is affordable there, and the question is, is it really affordable? Well, one of the things that it also did was it told the insurance companies that they had to spend 80 cents of the premium on the dollar, 80 cents on the dollar on the premium on health care. First question the insurers was, said was, well, what do you mean by health care? And it wasn't a facetious remark. They said that because we have a lot of things that we do to help our diabetics do this or do that, and is that part of the health care cost? And the answer was no. No, health care is the direct access, the direct activities of the patients within the system, and all of the providers taking, uh, taking the uh, 80 cents on the dollar in, in terms of payment. And the insurers were given that mark uh, of 80 cents on the dollar in a grand bargain with the uh, uh, PPACA. And the reason they took it was because, I don't know about you, but uh, how much, what, what percentage on the dollar are you making currently in this environment? Uh, they're making a minimum of about 12 cents on the dollar giving 80 cents uh, toward health care. And the reason I say that is, is that it costs less than eight cents on the dollar to administrate the, uh, the insurance itself. And the reason we have those numbers is because we know what it costs for Medicare and Medicaid to uh, administer. And we understand that in the whole ideal of getting health care to everyone, whether it's a right or not, we've never really decided that as a country. But if it is a right, then it has to be accessible through affordability. And what's interesting is that we're dealing with a set of circumstances today that were created over a very long period of time. The very first HMO and the very first insurance plan both came out in 1927. HMOs are not a new thing. They didn't come into effect because the insurance cost too much or anything else. They were brand new at the same time. When we look at things like uh, one of the things I would have added to the slides that uh, Dr. Boyd put up was the McCarran-Ferguson Act of 1945. And the reason is, is that it exempts the business of insurance from most federal regulation, including antitrust laws, to a limited extent. And the reason that that's important is because in the state of New Jersey, the Department of Banking and Insurance has to determine whether a premium increase is real or imagined by the company. Is it because they want more profit or is it because they really needed it because they're covering so many lives or whatever and they had to take a bath, so to speak? And what's important about that is, is that the insurance companies made a deal, the pharmaceutical companies made a deal with the ACA. But if you'll notice recently, uh, the durable medical goods organizations have been fighting tooth and nail to save whatever they can. Now, I don't know about what the other doctors in the room uh, know exactly about their margin in their practice, but I practiced 30 years of private practice, and my margin was nowhere near 
what it is for the insurers and I'm about 10 times less <laughs> margin for the durable medical goods. They make more than a killing 10 times over in the cost that they pass along to whomever buys their products. So when we're talking about the Affordable Care Act, we're trying to get insurance to people who can't afford it in a way that they can't. That's the whole purpose. And if in the system we were in at the time, 48 million people did not get it, yet for some reason most of us think that we don't want them in the emergency room getting their care because the rest of us are paying for that care, we need to do, needed to do something. So when you ask yourselves the question, could the U.S. have better health care? Overwhelmingly, the answer's got to be yes. The data from the CDC here in the United States, in all of the states, prove that we can have better health care. Look at Appalachia. Look in any of the big cities in the state of New Jersey. Camden, Patterson, Passaic, Jersey City where I practice, Newark where I teach. There's no question they can use better health care. The question is should we have it and how do we get it? And under the circumstances, with insurers being able to make deals, with pharma making deals, how can you get better legislation? Well, it's difficult. Anybody that's gone to Trenton or gone to Washington, you, you absolutely know what it's like to deal with the people that are there. There's lobbyists on both sides, and it's very difficult. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Dr. Ja? Thank you, Dr. Boyd, and uh, thank you to Synapse, Rowan School of Medicine, Benjamin Rush Institute, Samir, Mark, and Beth for the invitation. Uh, I speak to you as a foreigner. Um, I trained in, the, in a national health service in the, in the UK and uh, spent most of my growing life mesmerized by the United States. And as mesmerized as I was when I arrived in the United States, I was completely awestruck by something about healthcare. It's sheer and utter size. It was abundant, it was in your face. I went to the hospital and you know, I saw fountains in the hospital for the first time. You don't get that in hospitals in the NHS. Uh, the stairs weren't rickety and people had their own rooms. And it struck me then, and as it strikes me now, what's the catch? Where does it all come from? Where did this money come from? And you should also be aware of my ideological um, inclination and I'm a, uh, I'm, I belong to the Austrian School of Economics. I believe in small free markets, price signals, uh, local knowledge. And I've been asking the question since then, I don't know I have the answers. Were healthcare left to the unfettered free market, would we have what we have right now? Would I have a job? I'm a radiologist. I look at cardiac MRIs. It's high-end technology. Would we have Herceptin if people were still paying out of their pocket? And, and I think, I believe the answer is no. You needed some form of collective money collection, which we call insurance. So um, before I go further into this rant, I should also just tell you what I think the solution is, which is a two-tier health system, and I will explain to you why I think that is. But let's go back to the free market and uh, insurance. Um, when insurance companies compete in the free market, competition, a very good thing that we all hear about in the free market, what do they compete for? They compete for the healthiest patient. And not only do they compete for the healthiest patient, they try their best to get the sickest patient or get out of paying. And let me give you one example of that. Um, um, I, I have a son who's six years old. He's, he's got a friend uh, in school who fell down in a little bit of an altercation with another friend. He went to the children's hospital and uh, he had a fracture and then a week later, his mother gets a call saying, from the insurance company saying, oh, um, I heard he was in a bit of a fight. Can you give me the name of the parents who's, you know, who, who, whose kid he fought with? Presumably to defray some of the costs. And I think this is rather, it's unfortunate that it has come to this. And therefore, the insurance companies need some form of, uh, some form of regulation. And that's where the government steps in. And so the idea of having completely unfettered market just simply does not work in healthcare as it works with, for example, iPads. We don't know when we need healthcare. Having said that, 
I don't think Obamacare is the solution. One of the big problems with Obamacare, it's like Kaiser associated, the biggest trick he uh, pulled was to convince the world that the devil didn't exist. The biggest trick Obamacare pulled was to convince everyone that it wasn't about, uh, that it costs don't matter. Of course costs matter. There's a very basic economic truism. You keep people alive, it's gonna cost. You, the more certain they are of dying, the harder you try and keep them alive, it, the more it's gonna cost. The idea that you can break this golden tri uh, triangle and have lower quality, uh, higher quality care with lower costs is quite honestly Alice in Wonderland. It's not gonna work, and better we have a, a discussion about it right now. Now, I don't think healthcare is a right, because the WHO definition of healthcare is so expansive, it's not only a state of absence of infirmity, it's a complete state of social, physical well-being. Now, by that definition, every time my wife watches Keeping Up With The Kardashians, my health care right is being violated because my soul is being destroyed. <laughs> so I don't think health care is right. But that doesn't matter. That's not the part of the argument because we should not conflate a 20-year-old from an economically disadvantaged environment who doesn't have insurance, who, has, who needs splenectomy, and was either dead or bankrupt because he doesn't have insurance from a 75-year-old who needs to have PET CT for Aricept. No, healthcare needs to be partitioned. It's not a one size all. There is essential care and there is non-essential care. So we need to have a discussion and that involves actually annoying special interest groups saying essential care should have some form of single system <coughs> either single administration or single payer, and non-essential care, the marginal care that the East Side New Yorkers sipping their latte wish to get, put it to the free market. That's my solution. Thank you, everybody, for your opinions. So we have, now we're going to start the discussion part of the evening, which should be fun. And before we start that, I uh, want to set some ground rules for everybody. As you can see, I think all of the panelists are quite passionate about their beliefs, and um, I think that that's very palpable. And as you're listening and forming your own opinions, and you may already have some very passionate opinions yourself, so uh, we want to try to keep this very uh, professional and collegial and respectful in our tone for this evening as we ask our questions and as we um, kind of debate with each other on the panel and from the audience. So I just wanted to kind of set those ground rules. So um, now we're going to open it up for questions. We invite you to come to the microphones and we'll take you in order from alternate microphones. And um, the, when we ask the questions, I'm gonna ask uh, one panelist, you may, you may pose it to a particular panelist or you may open it up. And then whoever open, answers first will get three minutes and then if somebody wants to rebut that comment, we can give an additional two minutes. So that's the format for the question and answer session. So I'm gonna start as the, um, take the prerogative of the moderator and the microphone. So um, it, you, you talk, all of you talked a little bit about access to care and cost of care and how your plan was going to affect that. What I'd like to know from each of you briefly is how is your proposal going to affect quality of care um, in healthcare? So quality has an awful lot to do with cost. So does affordability, so does access. And what we have to be able to figure out is the best way to manage scarce resources. How do you do that? How do you know what is the right way to use any resource? Is it for a particular aspect of healthcare, essential, or what somebody else might consider non-essential? How much of our limited resources do we want to spend on healthcare versus other things? What economics teaches us, it's a matter of supply and demand. And when you want quality, it costs. The right amount of medical errors is not zero, just like the right amount of pollution is not zero molecules of pollution. And everything above that has a cost. So you have to figure these cost benefits. And I would argue that they're not one size fits all, that every single human being is unique, every single human being is important, and they are the ones that know best how to allocate their scarce resources. I don't think that, I mean, I know that you can't have 
everybody getting everything they need in any system. So it comes down to how do you decide that? Do you do it through a political process of special interests battling it out amongst the politicians? Or do you do it in a system that assures that everybody is working for a voluntary exchange? Because when you have voluntary exchange, you only make a, an exchange when you, both parties consider themselves to having be better off with that exchange. So free market creates win-win, political solutions create win-loss. Um, but that, that question about what quality is has to be figured out on a case-by-case -case basis, cost-benefit, using free market prices as the signals about the best placement of resources. Just go all the way down? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in order to get the best medical care for the lowest cost, which is kind of what we would all agree would be the best thing to do, there ought to be three tiers of um, health care. For those with jobs who could afford insurance, they ought to be able to buy the insurance. And I would recommend buy a high deductible insurance. It'll be the lowest price. And that's to cover things that you're not expecting to happen. You don't want to happen. Um, and that's really what insurance ought to be for. But then they ought to pay directly for primary care. And with the savings of this, uh, the huge premium that you're not having to pay, you could now pay. And it's just like taking your car to get main maintained. It's not that expensive when you pay cash and when there's not all of that paperwork that the doctor has to be submitting to get paid. But for people who are poor, people who don't own a house, they don't have assets to protect, they really don't need insurance. And that's what the, uh, the whole fallacy of the Affordable Care Act was. They don't need insurance. What they need is medical care when they need medical care. And when they find themselves sick or they have a chronic problem, they need to know there's a place that they could go where there's kind people that'll take care of them even if they can't pay. And that's the essence of our um, non-government free clinic where volunteers um, take care of them. And um, that was where we have this idea where if a doctor would donate four hours a week of every specialty, then we would like the state simply to protect us from medical malpractice in our private practices. I was talking with a neurosurgeon the other day. I said, we are one of these rare breeds now. He goes, yeah, there's only 60 neurosurgeons left in the state of New Jersey. And a couple years ago, there were 90. They're leaving New Jersey. And that's because the malpractice is so onerous. We're not going to get tort reform. Um, uh, it's just there are too many special interests that absolutely stop that. But with our concept of um, just protecting doctors who donate their time, then um, we could really show compassion to the poor, keep the specialists here, keep the doctors here, the obstetricians, and um, we'd get the best care for the lowest cost. I think <clears throat> what we have learned um, by looking at uh, healthcare around the world is that universal access not only provides care to everyone, but it actually reduces cost and increases quality. Now, the idea that you reduce costs um, seems um, counterintuitive to most Americans, but if we look at the first charts we saw up there, we saw every nation that has universal access to health care actually has um, lower cost, in many cases half the costs of the United States while providing care that is at least as good, even though there's a lot of controversy about the studies and quality of care. <clears throat> uh, those countries provide health care that is at least as good as our health care. Our systems that do provide universal uh, access, for example, Medicare uh, in this country, uh, provides access to uh, over 98% of senior citizens, like me. And um, our senior citizens are actually very comparable in health status to the uh, uh, health status of citizens in other countries uh, who do provide universal health care. So we know that when we provide access to health care in the United States to everyone, <coughs> we can become more economical, higher quality, and become uh, comparable to other nations in the healthcare quality that we delivered. We know that even small interruptions in insurance can have disastrous effects. Studies have shown that if you're without healthcare for any period of time, your risk 
uh, or uh, insurance for any period of time, your risk of mortality increases by 40%. That accounts for some uh, 45,000 excess deaths per year because people are moving in and out of the healthcare system. So a simple thing like providing universal access will actually increase our quality drastically, reduce our costs, and put us on a par with other nations. I think, uh, you know, quality is an interesting uh, question in, in a lot of ways, but the, the uh, studies that we've done on uh, data across the country uh, in a particular uh, format showed that patients who had Medicare actually were better cared for in terms of all indicators of patient outcomes data than commercial insurance patients. They had better care, and some of the reasons and Obamacare, I'm sorry, I forgot what that actually means, but the PPACA actually states that when you have Medicare, you don't have to pay copays now for preventive care, which was keeping several of, uh, of the people that were in Medicare from the doctor's office. So they're paying for that. Uh, I don't know about any of you, but there are probably a few of you in here that stayed on your parents' insurance until you were 26. Did, did you like that or was that stupid? Do you think that should have been repealed? Probably like that for that year or two you did that. Um, but some of the other things that the PPACA did was it gave uh, women the right to insurance at the same price. Did you know that women always paid more for health insurance than men did? Why? Because they'd have kids and it would be a problem, things like that. Well, women actually now are paying the same premiums that men were uh, in the uh, PPACA. And that goes with all of the definitions of preventative care that that affords them. And it's very important because when you look at the expectation of the individual, their expectation that when they don't have insurance is if I'm about to die, I know I can get it when I go to the emergency room. Other than that, I don't really expect it. And when you look at places that uh, are out of this country, like Canada, for instance, there is no expectation for radiation therapy for cancer on a regular basis. Typically, they will pay for it if you come to the United States to get it. But you have to come here, pay your own way, and live in a hotel typically till you get your however many days of radiation oncology that you were prescribed and then go back to Canada and then submit your bills for the actual radiation. But the quality, when we look at the Affordable Care Act, the built-in quality just from the prevention itself and from the change in expectation for the individuals who will be getting insurance of some kind, even if it's just catastrophic, actually goes way up. Thank you. So there are two uh, related questions. The first is, um, does quality matter? And of course, quality matters. I don't think anyone can really dispute that. There's a study about a couple of weeks ago in the New England Journal where they showed that surgeons that had higher quality in terms of their operating skills had um, lower complications. Um, the next question is, can quality be measured? And that, of course, depends how far you are from what you're measuring. And the closer you are towards your measuring, the more accurately your measurement's going to be. Because quality is an information issue, and information costs. So any time you measure something, you're, it costs. And you have to ask yourself, does the cost of what I'm measuring actually justify the measurement itself? And um, with the, 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 the Affordable Care Act, uh, the, 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 the two are sort of moving at very different speeds, right? almost like expanding universe versus uh, expanding oceans. And so um, the, the, the tool, the measurement itself, is expanding, when, whereas what it actually yields is not expanding at the same rate. Um, so what you can have and what you risk having are Lots and lots of data, piles and piles of it, um, lots of which are complete noise, some of which is signal, and all physicians actually gaming the system to actually meeting those quality requirements. So there is a huge risk 
that um, just measuring for the sake of measurement, because you have to draw the line somewhere in terms of quality, um, is, 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 can be problematic. Now, the third issue, which I think has been somewhat conflated, is outcome. Now, uh, do, does higher quality deliver better outcome? Of course, of course it does. But how do you measure the outcome? Can you use the nation's mortality survival as an outcome? And I don't think you can, because if you are, the two countries, uh, uh, United States and Europe, have very def uh, different definitions for what constitutes live birth. And it's precisely in the area that um, wouldn't be called a live birth anywhere else, and therefore they'll have a s smaller denominator, that the American healthcare throws lots and lots of money towards neonatal intensive care. And on the top end, whereas it's very difficult, I can tell you from experience in the NHS, getting an ICU bed if you're 90 years old and you have um, advanced dementia um, with metastatic cancer, here you will get further investigations and an ICU bed because nobody says stop over here. So at both ends, money is being poured over, but you're not really comparing apples and oranges, or rather you're comparing 10 apples and eight apples, but you don't know that the other two apples are missing. So uh, in summary, I do think quality matters. I do think quality does lead to outcomes, but I don't think the way we're measuring them currently really has any foundation for reproducibility, or rather to lose sleep over. Okay, thank you. Um, now I'd like to open it up to questions. So first to the microphone. Hi. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself, that'd be great. Is it on? Push the back of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm Arvind Kable. I'm an endocrinologist in solo practice in uh, Lower Bucks County, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, a ton of questions, but uh, an, an important question uh, that uh, pertains to all of you in the audience. Uh, we know that um, the, the ACA uh, uh, sort of um, the the lifeblood of the ACA is participation in the insurance uh, programs uh, from youngsters like you, okay? Um, difference between you youngsters and the rest of the youngsters are that you are all gonna be doctors. And hopefully, you'll be in the top 10% of earners in a few years. So, uh, as, a, as, a, as a result of that, <clears throat> you will not only be contributing your dollar in terms of sharing the insurance costs, but you're also going to be contributing an excess amount of tax dollar to supplement the insurance costs for the other folks who probably didn't work as hard as you guys and didn't go to medical school. So my question to all the gray-haired people in this room is, <clears throat> there was a nice article in the Wall Street Journal last weekend about something called generational theft. Is this a generational theft or not? So are the younger people going to be paying for the um, care of the elderly? Right. Okay. So I'm going to try to answer this very shortly. And, and then it's very clear that the, the ACA makes it so that the young and the healthy pay more so that the old and the sick pay less. So there is this cost shift built in within it. And amongst all of those things, what, what the people who support the ACA like to do is, is really emphasize the winners, and there's winners and losers here. So women pay less now, and, and their premiums used to cost more because they used healthcare more. They were more expensive patients. 26-year-olds get to be on their um, insurance, but somebody's paying for that. There is no free healthcare. We're not making it more affordable, we're just shifting who is paying the cost, and that's the young and the healthy, so that the old and the disabled and the sick can pay less. Now, you might think that that's the right thing to do, but that's what we're doing. We are cost shifting. It's a wealth transfer system. It's not insurance. Actually, it is insurance, because insurance is, is a pooling of risk. And we are, <clears throat> uh, we're all in this uh, uh, pool together. Um, right now, it, it is a, a wealth transfer because I have Medicare and you don't. Why don't you have it? I would ask that question um, right now. Um, to, why did we decide only to, to insure people over the age of 65 and provide them with very good health coverage 
Um, it's some of the best insurance I've had in my entire life, and you're without it. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> but um, social insurance is the uh, concept of uh, understanding that we pool risk as a nation, just as we uh, pool the cost of education. Now, as a senior citizen, I actually pay a disproportionate uh, share of my taxes for young children who are getting an education, and I have no children at home now. So, you know, this works both ways. That's the, that is the part of social insurance. It says we spread the costs across the entire population so that everyone benefits, and the cost is affordable to everyone. Uh, we do this through uh, uh, our systems of taxation and redistribution, to be quite honestly honest. Uh, that's the way our systems work. Uh, we don't just pick and choose the things that we want. Those of us who want defense, we all have to pay for it. Those of us who want social, social services, again, we all have to pay for it. The concept of social insu ins insurance is the thing that actually provides access and equality and a fairness for everyone. You're going to be involved for your entire life, not just when you're 65. Let's just have one more response to that. Can I just say, um, the problem is that with the Medicare system, it is bringing our country into bankruptcy and we're spending $1.40 for every dollar we bring in, bring in in taxes the next generation is going to have to be um, paying for that. It might have seemed like a very good system when it started, but the cost overruns have been huge. And um, so something's going to have to give. And uh, so I think that by putting everybody onto Medicare, we'll just go bankrupt that much faster. OK, can I? Um, hello. I have a loud voice. Uh, so my name is Kanan. I'm a third year medical student. I have a million questions, which means I'm going to keep on rotating from side to side. Um, <laughs> but my first question, I think, is something that I definitely would like all five of you to answer in a yes or no or sort of-ish answer is, do you think insurance should be tied to employers? Maybe. Do I think that um, it should be incentivized by our tax laws? No. Right. When the employer pays for it, it's really coming out of your paycheck. And it's the tax code that's made that happen. So in a sense, I think you ought to be able to buy insurance. And the only thing that the government should do is to make sure that that insurance company keeps the contract and doesn't drop you when you get sick. Yeah, employers should not be responsible for, for health care. Um, it's only an anomaly uh, that uh, really came to us in World War II when we had wage and price controls and the only benefit you could offer to employees was health care. So we ended up with this strange situation where we were providing health care to employees as a benefit. Um, it's bad economically. It ties people to jobs they don't want. It, uh, it um, suppresses the growth of new, young, and small industries. It's just a bad idea all around. Uh, let's get he uh, health insurance out of indus industry. We agree. Yay! <laughs> Actually, employer uh, health care started uh, back in 1927. Uh, railroads, mining companies, different companies like that started buying uh, and self-insuring actually. And they started hiring physicians to work for them uh, in the shanty towns where they, where they had uh, the coal mines and other things. So it was uh, part and parcel of the cost of doing business was actually uh, health care. Whether it's right or wrong is another question, but the, the real question is why are we allowing or why are we even submitting ourselves to a position where the insurance companies can actually dictate and decide on their own how much to charge us? Because that's pretty much what's happening. Uh, not one state in this country is really capable of keeping down health care costs, yet they're the ones that can, they're the only ones that can do it. It can't be done by the federal government in terms of uh, uh, the McCarran-Ferguson Act, as I mentioned earlier. So here in New Jersey, 
you saw a huge increase in insurance premiums for the, few, for the first few years before the um, uh, PPACA went into effect. That was for them to get as much out of the system as possible before they were going to get ratcheted down. So the question is, if we are going to have insurance to begin with, why aren't they as regulated as the physicians are in taking care of the patients in terms of how much money they're allowed to make? And uh, if the system is going broke, why are they the ones making money? You know, Medicare has Medicare Advantage programs which have been given stipends over the years so that they can provide extra care. All it is is extra government funding for them that never really translated into better outcomes at all. As a matter of fact, some of them had worse outcomes. So I think there's unanimous agreement here. The answer is no, absolutely not. And also, um, uh, the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the fads in uh, Obamacare, I wonder if Dr. Oz was responsible for this one, was the wellness program. The idea that employers will get rebates if they can get their employees to run on the treadmill, lower their cholesterol, lower their blood pressure, do yoga, but I'm sorry, my employer, it's none of your business. What I do on Saturday night, how much alcohol I drink, that's totally none of your business, stay out of this. So the whole combination, it's a very ugly, intrusive model, which really the employer-based insurance is one aspect of it, and the, this wellness program is another. So I think I'm totally in agreement with everyone here. Um, if insurance is to survive, it ought to be one monolith. You can call it a single-payer system. You can call it um, everyone's HSA, or as the uh, 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 highly eloquent neurosurgeon whose name escapes me from Johns Hopkins, um, ben, Carson. ben Carson said everyone should get a certain amount of money uh, on birth, which they can use as they wish for healthcare, education, whatever. And I think any of those ideas is better than what we have right now. It's a road <laughs> to serfdom. I think we'll all be lining up. <laughs> We're going to alternate mics. So. Yes, hello. Um, my name's Nora Craig. I'm a systems engineer, designer, and uh, I'd come into your environment and I'd set up everything from your organization and your table of responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera, uh, inclusive of your IT and time and motion studies and you name it. I look at what socialists and ideologues are saying about the health care system and ADA or Obamacare and it scares me to death because it's completely unrealistic from a systemic perspective. It's pie in the sky. It's wishful thinking. And one of the things I want all you youngsters to think about and this is serious as cancer, is enslavement. If you are a human being and you do not have choice. Do you have a question? Yes, I'm going to ask my question shortly. And you do not have choice, then you are enslaved. If we have government health care and all of the physicians and all of the insurance companies, and all the durable medical product companies, and everybody else who services healthcare in any way, must follow the direction of the master, then what is it that makes you not a slave? And I would like the panel to address how this is impacting our lack of physicians. Physicians now are retiring earlier, one of the statistics that Dr. Eck has given me was that instead of physicians retiring at 65, they're now retiring on average at 50. Can, and can you ask your question? What's the yes. question? Yes. How is anything of what all of you are saying going to impact us having physicians to provide the care? Cost is an element, but without these youngsters coming up to fill the voids, we won't have health care. How are you going to address that? How does ADA address that? What it does is it chases physicians out of the system. It does not encourage them to participate. So it's a great question. How, are, how is the plan that you're proposing going to affect physicians? The and the physician I, supply? The plan that I am suggesting where um, doctors who provide charity care would be protected 
then they could go ahead and start private practices and not have um, that specter of the malpractice system over their heads. They just have to provide good care. Um, and patients would choose them. And that's how you choose quality. There's no government deciding what your quality is. The patients are deciding. That is the, the most um, patient-centric type of um, health care, which is the most satisfying. You're not old enough to remember Marcus Welby, but that was a program that you could watch. It was in the 70s. You could get it on, on Netflix. You just see this, the, how the patients just love their doctor, and they, they uh, stayed with the same doctor. And they, it, it was a, a very um, rewarding experience for both the doctor and the patients. That's what we need to get back to, and I'd love to see uh, private practice get revived. The United States has one of the highest rates of dissatisfaction with the practice of medicine, especially in primary care physicians. Um, most of this, uh, when you look at surveys, is because of the difficulty they have in providing the care that their patients need, given our current payment system. So when you look at the survey data that shows uh, uh, do you have problem? Ask the questions. Do you have problems obtaining the the coverage for the services that your patients want uh, want and need uh, from your insurance company? Um, a, a large proportion of U.S. physicians say they have a lot of problems. It's much higher than other countries that have universal access. Is by the way, only two uh, countries come up uh, fairly close to us, and one is Germany, which is mishmash of 200 different systems um, uh, that are uh, similar to our mishmash of systems, um, and Australia, which also has a, a, a large and scattered private system. But um, guaranteeing universal access and universal payment, uh, what that also means, uh, really increases the physician's freedom and uh, ability to work directly with patients. Uh, it's interesting to look at um, all the managed care uh, systems that have developed uh, over the years and the amount of problems that physicians have uh, in being reviewed by insurance companies. These systems were dropped by Medicare early on in its history. Uh, we used to have things called PSROs and other review organizations. Physicians complained about them, Medicare dropped them. They then went out and sold their services to insurance companies uh, who have been using them ever since. Uh, we know that uh, utilization review doesn't really help uh, the quality or even the cost of medicine, uh, but we continue with it. It's one of the greatest problems that physicians have in the United States dealing with the health care system. A uh, simple answer to your question is uh, medical schools have increased class size and the number of medical schools in the United States by about 30 percent in the past few years. Um. I, there's, there's, I need to address one of the things that um, Dr. Thar has said, which he's continued to talk about the other healthcare systems throughout the world and using them as they're, they've had this basically universal coverage because they either have a socialized system like the NHS, single payer, which is socialized paying, or they have mandatory compu compulsory health insurance. But in France, which was rated number one by the, the World Health Organization, most of the sickness funds, which are the equivalent of the risk pooling, um, run in um, perpetual states of loss in the red. In Japan, over half of the hospitals consistently run deficits. In Hong Kong, in Germany, these sickness funds are not financially sustainable or viable. So you think that it's functioning, but it's not if you really look at it. One of the, one of the again, things that you learn in economics is you can't just look at one segment. You have to look at how the entire system is being, um, fun is, is functioning. And, if, and where I got these statistics was from a book that was um, written by a guy named Reed who is in favor of single payer. So it's not that I'm getting these from some, someplace else that talks about the failings of all the other systems. That's because they're mixed systems. There isn't a healthcare system in the world that is functioning properly. You can do it with economic freedom, which creates an abundance. You grow the pie, 
And that's going to help the people at the bottom because the people at the bottom have more. Or you can concentrate on having government control, which means cutting things. And that's how these other countries control their costs, is by denying care, cutting care. They're constricting, and they just slice the pie differently. The real way to prosperity is the way we've gotten ourselves to help feed the hungry, to help clothe everybody, and that is with the free market profit and loss system that creates an abundance, creates prosperity. Okay. So I don't think you need to worry about doctor shortage um, because these young people are not going into Wall Street, not after 2008. And um, I can't think of very many. The lawyers aren't getting jobs, so um, they'll, they'll be streaming into medicine. And the one thing to... Uh, actually appreciate, and I'm not saying this with any degree of facetiousness, is that um, according to the medical profession, the American Medical Association, myself as a radiologist, the only thing worse than doctor shortage is actually doctor surplus. That's a huge problem, because now you've got all these people with huge debts and they haven't got jobs to get to. So there will always be that slight under-representation, and uh, thankfully there are still people from various parts of the world that want to move to the United States for various reasons. So shortage of medical uh, facility is not something that necessarily would, uh, would become a concern. The concern really is, will the practice of me medicine change with the Affordable Care Act? And I think that um, there are two ways to look at that. The first is to see, say is what practice are we exactly talking about? And I think um, there are, there's compelling arguments on both sides. One which is, which is say that that trust, the doctor-patient trust that forms from a, some sort of um, minimization of the middleman is something that definitely there is a risk with greater bureaucratic um, uh, prevalence uh, for that to disappear. So medicine as we know it, and not simply from the perspective of a patient, but from the perspective of the physician, may change and may change irreversibly. And I think that's just a combination of a managerial trend that we're seeing, combination of technology and management. But shortage itself, well, put it this way, I don't think people will be flying off the Kaplan-Meyer survival curve because of the lack of doctor shortage because of the Affordable Care Act. That would be So we have a lot of, we're going to move on now. The, um, we have a lot of questions lined up, so I'd like to keep the responses to two minutes, and we'll just have a couple of people responding to each question so we can get to everybody's question. Nick? Hi. Uh, Nick Anacarico, second year osteopathic medical student. Um, my first <coughs> question is, um, it's sort of rhetorical, and it had to go off Kanats first, and it was, you all agreed <coughs> that employers shouldn't pay for people's insurance, so then who does? And Dr. Jha, at the end, you said that if you decide to go and live your life however you want, the employer shouldn't, but then do I? But that's the rhetorical question. The real one is that costs keep going up in the United States, um, and there are many arguments that doctors are, are not getting reimbursed fairly. So where exactly is all this money going, and how does the free market or the ACA address this? Do you have anybody that you'd like to target that to first? Um, no. <laughs> Whoever wants ACA or free market. That's a really good question. Um, do you know in New Jersey we spend $13 billion on Medicaid and our whole budget is $33 billion. And the doctors get reimbursed so low they can't afford to, care, to take the Medicaid patients. Where is that money going? Uh, and it's just going, there's, there's people who are running um, these Medicaid HMOs, the executives are making millions and millions of dollars, and that is wrong. So that's why my passion is to watch charity care become real charity, and then the doctors would get, um, would get uh, malpractice protection, which would then allow them to have private practices. And the right, pri the right uh, fee for a physician is whatever it takes for him to be happy to be there and to be there for you, so that, uh, and I'm saying it's not more than getting your car serviced. So that is the way it should be. You should pay cash. Who should buy your insurance? If your employer is not buying your insurance, then he's paying you more um, in salary. And then you go out into the free market. You should be able to buy the insurance you want from the company you want, from the state you want, with the coverage you want, with the deductible you want. That's a true free market. 
One of the largest excess costs we have in the United States are uh, for health care overhead costs. As I mentioned before, about 31 cents out of every dollar goes strictly for overhead, does not provide any service to patients at all, and is one of the biggest drivers of higher costs uh, in our system. We really don't have a marketplace uh, for health care. We have patients who go to doctors, and doctors actually purchase most of the health care in this country. Um, but they do it based on their professional opinion, and not that patients necessarily have a, a lot of choice in that. We have some parts of our system that actually do have a market system, and those are commodity items like um, LASIK surgery and a few other areas where there are standardized procedures that are elective. Uh, that uh, amounts to about 10, maybe 20 percent of total health care costs that could actually be commoditized and be in a consumer uh, market uh, situation. The problem we have is that health care costs are very high because people get really sick. And when people get really sick, it costs a lot of money. So in a general commercial plan, 1% of the population represents 25% of health care costs. So insurance is a very important part of our system. The marketplace will never deal with these very high cost uh, patients that are very sick. Uh, it dis the market system is not there to, uh, to make choices. Uh, we don't have alternatives. Sorry, it, Robert, Robert, you say that it costs a lot when they get really sick. Yes. Because I, I would argue that doctors really don't see the majority of that. So who does? Well, these, these are patients that uh, get most uh, physicians, especially primary care f physicians, will not see these very sick patients. Um, they, uh, they amount, uh, again, about 1% of the population in a commercial population represents 25 to 30 percent of health care costs. So if you have 1,000 patients, one of them might be a high-cost patient. If you're an actuary working for a health insurance company, if you can eliminate, you know, um, 10 patients out of 1,000, you've already saved your company 25% of health care costs. So the whole insurance system really, again, needs to be spread across the entire population. The risk needs to be spread, and we need to make uh, access more universal. Yeah, you're getting closer to the big question, and that is uh, the change in the, in the payment system for physicians who do drive a lot of the costs in health care. And they drive it for many different reasons, whether it's uh, what was alluded to earlier about tort reform and the basically cover your rear end when you uh, come to the emergency room. And yet, it's not totally that. You know, it, it, it's, it's, there's, a lot, there's a lot more to that. And when you look at it, the way emergency medicine has evolved, it started with primary care doctors going to the hospital because they didn't want to open their offices and then they would, decided, well, one of you is going to take Monday, another one's going to take Tuesday, so they don't all have to go to treat all their patients. And then all of a sudden, it became its own, its own discipline, and the thought process changed even more considerably because they didn't know all of the patients the way they did when they were doing primary care in their office. So they started thinking, gee, this patient could have, and that's when it all went crazy because the first thing you do in the emergency room is make sure they don't have the worst possible thing that they could possibly have with that diagnosis. The reality is, is that if you think about it, if the most common problem presenting to you is going to be the answer 95% of the time, why are we spending so much money in the emergency room on the other, looking for the zebras really, because that's what they are in that case scenario. So if you tie the quality to the payments of physicians, then it will change. PPACA doesn't really do that in a big way. That's the sustainable growth rate that is out there now. That will change potentially before December 15th or so. That may be seen as, as another thing that may come up that you should be looking for uh, this congressional term. But with that said, <clears throat> you know, you're looking at the PPACA and you're seeing that they are willing to pay 
for Medicaid patients at the same rate they pay Medicare patients. So that that Medicaid patient that previously would make me uh, you know, see red in my office because it would cost me more to see them than it would to treat them, and I don't want to take them, now if they're at Medicare rates, I may very well be taking them in my private practice. Except the taxpayers okay. are going to pay way too much. All right, I think we're going to end on that. You're paying no matter what. You're either going to pay to see them in the office, you're going to pay to see them in the emergency room as taxpayers. As taxpayers. All right, we're going to go over to this side for another question. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm uh, Dr. John Eck. I'm the other Dr. Eck. Um, I've been, we've been running a clinic, just the two of us, as an example, for 10 years. We've seen over 30,000, 40,000 patients for free at no cost to the taxpayer. We've done analysis because of the Federal Tort Claims Act of 1996 that if a physician sees a patient and does not have to worry about being sued, that you have universal access without socialized medicine. Because in fact, if two doctors who still run a private practice and still can make a living can see the poor for free, <clears throat> and the Federal Tort Claims Act can protect us, why not extrapolate this system into the whole country? Why do we insist on having third parties, governments, agencies? Why not incentivize the physician? Nothing is more expensive than when it's free. The problem with socialism is you allow people to privatize behavior and socialize the consequences. And you shift the burden to the most responsible people in society. And you treat the, the, the miscreant, if you will, yeah. as a child. A, do you so have a question? What my question is simple. That was what my question was. Why do we not look at simple charity as you know, an the, example the, there's charity of care. care? There's charity care like that all over the country. But that's false Sister, charity if it's government. No, no. Sister Ann Brooks is in Tutwiler, Mississippi. All she does is see 100,000 people a year totally for free. She's a, she's a nun that went back to school, became a DO, and she practices in Tutwiler. Any student that wants to get down there, spend some time, that's where I would recommend you go. It's 100%. She has no other practice, no other income, no income. So no question, we should extrapolate that, take every nun right now, put them in osteopathic medical school, and send them out there. I think it'd be great. <laughs> Dr. Haynes, do you have a response to that? No. Yeah. Okay. She's never been sued either. It's amazing. <laughs> but you have other, you have other uh, specialists. Question. Okay. Question over here, Roger. Uh, Roger Stewart, third year osteopathic student. Uh, my question is to Dr. Haynes. Um, I guess it seems like from your presentation you want to leave the entirety of healthcare to the free market. Uh, my question is what type of free market solution would you suggest? to um, serve the underserved populations that we have in all of our states because they can't afford to give, you know, be members of the free market to engage in that. So how would you cover them? I don't think we're gonna get there overnight. I think a lot, I think that the number of people who can't afford it is extremely um, artificially enlarged because we have priced them out of affordable health care by a lot of the regulations. And, and people have, I think that those people are the biggest victims of government intervention into, into medicine because would you rather um, have to rely on other people to help you make ends meet and, and live a livable life or would you rather be an independent individual and have access to the affordable housing, a job, healthcare, whatever it is. And I think clearly people would say if we could come up with a system that maximizes the number of people who can have affordable access to quality, everything, that's going to be best. And if you look at countries um, across time, across the world, the more economic freedom, the more, um, the more prosperity there is, and the people at the bottom do much better, very much so. It's um, because they're in, a, in 10 times the amount of wealth. So I think what we have to do is have a system that, that takes it stepwise back. You can't take away Medicare for the people who have been planning on it for all their working lives. You can't immediately remove the safety nets that we have 
on public assistance, but what we have to do is ratchet back the amount of government intervention that's artificially increasing the price of health care and health insurance that prices them out of affordable care. Does that answer your question? Thank you. We're going to go over here. Um, hi, my name is Leonard Schwartz. I'm a first year student here. And um, one of the things that I've been realizing that really has not been addressed, even with like the ACA Act and everything, is um, over the past few years in medicine, we've seen insurance companies take more of a stand in, in terms of dictating what should and should not be done, even in terms of medications, what medication a patient, patient should and should not be taking. When you have the physician who is supposedly going to medical school and earning, you know, going, putting forth all this effort and going through all this training to know best, so then why is it in all this healthcare reform we're not trying to reform it to a system where the doctor is really in charge as opposed to answering to the insurance company for every single thing? Well, the thing with that uh, is that, as annoying as it is having third parties decide, you have to see what areas are those decisions being made. And mostly, the quibble occurs in things that have very low value, number one, very low incremental value. Number two, they're very expensive, and they've just come into the market, so a newly patented drug. And, uh, and, 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 and thirdly, there is often uh, interest between the physician and the technology itself. So I don't think anyone has an argument anymore. The insurance company doesn't say, by the way, you should prescribe aspirin for acute MI, you shouldn't. The argument is, should you use pravastatin or some other statin? Should you use echo, stress echo? And so by the time you've come to that kind of argument, realize one thing, that it's small differences very small differences. No matter how much the uh, technology is going to promote itself and say, wow, we're the best, these are small differences. And if every physician, if the only, uh, if the only uh, hallmark of prescribing was something was a little bit better, no matter how fast, how much it cost, um, that's, that's pie in the sky thinking, I'm afraid. I mean, the country is going to be brought down to its knees. Dr. Cavalli's point, the partnership of generation is going to be far easily uh, messed up by that. You do need to have some sort of cost. And uh, physicians singularly are unable to do that because of their, of their uh, relationship with the patient, one of the agent relationship, you know, the uh, I look after the patient, cost shouldn't matter, but costs do matter. And uh, my bottom line message to you is that a lot of these arguments are occurring in marginal differences, not huge differences. Hi, I'm back. Um, so, <laughs> last chance. Something that I don't think anyone at any time has ever really addressed in any part in this debate in the last 20 years is the cost of medical education. Um, I think part and parcel of the discussion as to what plan ultimately should work is the burden that it puts on the students. For example, in countries where the medical system is more socialized, the cost of education, medical education is far less than what it is here. For example, there's no undergraduate education, it's straight to medical school as it is in the UK. And that kind of price on the medical student, four years of undergrad, whether you go to some graduate program to become more competitive in four years of medical school, you're leaving debt upwards of half a million dollars. And in that regard, I, in theory, would like to enter a system that maximizes the fastest way to pay back my loans, whether that's a single payer system, whether that's a health savings account, some free market system. But I think this is the elephant in the room that never gets discussed. Is Actually, it's discussed constantly. <coughs> Fair. So, so the answer is your, your assumption uh, that it isn't is, is, is a, a bit off. I can tell you that having met with uh, HHS uh, HRSA, which runs the National Health Service Corps, uh, most of the entities that are the Department of De Defense, which would include all, uh, all of the scholarships by all the armed forces, uh, all of the uh, organizations that have started in each state that have run things like doctors across New York, willing to pay $250,000 up front for you to go to a place of need as defined by in the state of New York, and I'm using that as a specific example because 60% of New York is a primary care shortage area, including areas of Manhattan. So if you go to a school, if you want to go to New York when you graduate, you can get $250,000 $250, up front 
to go ahead and get one of those scholarships. Now, you can practice in, uh, in various areas of New York, but I'm just saying as one area it could be Manhattan. Now, there are plenty other scholarship programs, but they've uh, basically quadrupled the size of the National Health Service Corps, and they've made it in such a way where you don't even have to be there full time, you can be there half time, still get your loans paid off, and still work in a private practice anywhere you want. So they have made major changes in those kinds of, of uh, loan repayments. Now, as far as debt goes, I would suggest to you that there are probably 15 or 20 uh, states in the United States that will give you total debt forgiveness to come back to your hometown and practice, as an example. And uh, places like Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, I know that Alabama has a program in which they pay for you to go to medical school. You don't have to pay back the loan. Alabama was paying to, for, for students to go to Nova Southeastern, uh, among other things. So there's a lot more I could say, but I have a sign here that says stop. <laughs> so the, the answer to your question is, it's talked about constantly everywhere. Did anybody else want to contribute to that question? No? I would just say that we need 70% of um, you to become, go into primary care if we're going to meet the healthcare needs of the people at the lowest possible cost. And our system definitely um, rewards people who go into the specialties that are more lucrative. And so that is really not, doesn't bode well for the uh, healthcare workforce. And, and that is one of the things that will be addressed in the revision to the payment system by Medicare and Medicaid to physicians. You will no longer be paid on an E&M code, e code system. Uh, it'll probably go more toward uh, a global fee that the primary care physician will be in charge of. As a matter of fact, Carolyn Clancy, who ran uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality in Washington 20 years ago, I it was not quite 20, she, hasn't, she didn't serve 20 years, but she served through several administrations, which is an unheard of kind of a thing in Washington. But because she was so good, she said back then, no question, we should just give all the money to the primary care physicians and let them dole it out because we'll have better health system if we do that. Now, she wasn't able to do that from her perch there at the uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, but the bottom line is, is that she did everything she could to get more money to the primary care physicians. And that was a 10% bump in Medicare uh, a couple of times and also in a, all of the health profession shortage areas as well as the medically underserved areas by federal designation, you got 10% bump. So, Medicare money. So, so those are some, some solutions about how to deal with the, where we are right now. We also have to understand how we got to the point where um, medical education is so astronomically expensive. And I, there's, there's some reading that I've done that I think find really interesting talking about higher education in general, and I think the professional educations even more so, are going to be the next financial bubble that we're going to see bursting. And that would get to, um, if you ever study some of the things about um, Austrian economics and what causes um, the whole cycle of boom and bust. And, and usually there's one sector that ends up having exploding um, costs uh, and prices, and we saw it in the housing market, and that bust. And now the next one is probably going to be in higher education. And, I, and it's, it's got to do, I think, again, with the way that the, um, we inter intervene in the free market. Hey, Dr. Heaton, you've been very patient. Hi, I'm Dr. Heaton. I'm Carol Heaton. I'm uh, Chair of Family Medicine. And so um, thank you, Marty, for coming and taking on the ACA because that's, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mishmash. It's really a put-together bill. It didn't have a public option. It didn't have real competition. It really put a lot of the power back into the insurance companies, which we all agreed was not such a great idea. I, 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 I really thank you all for coming. And with all due respect to the, to the to the uh, co competition area, I, I think there's really good data from what they call the Dartmouth study, which is people that take the data from Medicare, because Medicare is the only place that we have all the data come in to really know what's paid for health care. Remember, the insurance companies aren't going to compare. They're not going to tell you their secrets. They're not going to tell you how they keep costs down. They really won't even tell you necessarily how much they make on the bottom line. But the Dartmouth study is very clear that if you put more cardiologists in one area, Area, the cost of cardiology does not go down. The cost goes way up. 
If you put more orthopedic surgeons in one area, you have more knee replacements, not fewer. So I, I draw your attention to a couple books. One's called Overtreated and one's called Overdiagnosed. Easy to remember. But we spend more in this country. We just spend it on everything. And it's not just malpractice, although you can you can mention, you know, malpractice if you want. I'm a card-carrying member of PNHP, and so I'm, I'm really basically a single-payer advocate, although I'm intrigued by that two-tier thing with the extra, extra payment on top. I think we need to talk about this more here at school, and I really think Dr. Boyd will probably back me up, but we'll put together some more talks like this because you really need to go into the details of each one of these ideas. A lot has been said today, and um, a lot of things have been thrown around, and I think we need to really, you know, let's get the evidence to back it up and get some, some information because it, it would be hard to decide. Okay, my question. <laughs> um, I knew you were going to say that. Um, how do you, how does each one of your plans, or who wants to take on this question of over-treatment, over-diagnosis, and don't just tell me it's malpractice because it's much more than malpractice threats. Tell me how you're going to take care of this problem that we just tend to do more. Part of it's paying off our loans, right? You know, you do more, you get paid for doing more. So we're going to pay off our loans by doing more. How do you address that? So, so that's a great question. So I'm going to okay. take this because it's my favorite topic, and Welsh <laughs> is my, one of my favorite authors. He really speaks with a lot of candor, and he gets on people's nerves, which I would really like. Um, <laughs> you have to look at the. You have to look at. Uh, let me give you one example of uh, overdiagnosis. So I read cardiac MRs, and there's a certain um, criteria to look for sudden cardiac death, potential sudden cardiac death. And what we've noticed is that over time, that criteria has fallen. So it used to be, for example that the right ventricle had to be really bad, but now it's half, almost uh, um, a third of that. And the interesting question is why? And I don't think it's motivated by greed. I don't think so. I don't think the panel got together and said, oh, by the way, if we do that, we'll be more studies, more devices, and we'll all make lots of money, ha ha. No, I don't think so. I don't think it was motivated by malpractice either. Because I think that uh, when the panel again didn't get together, they didn't say, oh, let's share our subpoena, um, uh, I think what motivated it is something that is very expensive, unfettered, which is something we all possess as physicians. We're righteous, not necessarily self-righteous, but we're righteous. The question is, how do we curb that righteousness, this willingness to do more, willingness to be sensitive and pick up more stuff at the expense of being specific and false positives? And I think that that depends where we are. No, no, no Austrian, self-respecting Austrian economist will give you an answer straight away. They'll say, well, it depends where we're on the curve. If we're there on the curve, then perhaps different sort of incentives. But where we are on the curve right now, I do think at that margin, patients having to pay additional extra for that extra bit of security is the only way to curb it because clearly doctors have not been able to do it themselves. So, so I got to jump in with that idea. Part of the problem is that people, that neither the doctors nor the patients are considering the costs Go in, for the vast majority of medical decisions. And the example of this is, took, I took my daughter, and so I've, I'm you know, a physician, right? I took my daughter to an allergist. She says, oh my goodness, she's got polyps where she shouldn't have polyps. I think she has a partially expressed cystic fibrosis. Let's get some, some studies here. I said, okay, fine. Well, I have an HSA. So that means that the bill for that lab came back to me, $700. Never again am I going to do a test without asking how much does that cost. And the real kicker was going back into the office and she said, oh, you know what, I found out I really should have done the sweat test first, that's $25. So until both the doctors and the patients have to start thinking about what the cost of things are, we are not going to bring costs down. We are not going to get what's cost effective ever. So there was one other point, but I forgot. No, I, ab <laughs> I, ab I absolutely agree with both comments. And to put it, go further, you know, the Dartmouth Atlas study did say that if you live between Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, the chances of you getting quality care compared to someplace like Utah or Nevada, where there are many fewer specialists, much fewer hospitalizations, especially in the last six months of life, where the average number of, of visits to any physician in Utah was around 12 to 20. 
If you were between New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, it was somewhere around 44. So the question was, was quality of life improved by seeing those 44 doctor visits? The answer is hell no. As a matter of fact, this, the patients felt that their quality of life was actually lessened by it. So you have to be the primary care doctor to say to your patient when you get called after a, a patient suffers a stroke, it's diagnosed with something, or even way before that, and say, you know, I'm gonna be with you maybe for the next 20 years. What is it that you want your life to be like if certain problems were to occur? And have the conversation about end of life care sometime during your preventive care visits or whenever uh, uh, you possibly can. The real key is that you have to share that with the patient's family. There has to be some continuity uh, because that's where the costs have been demonstrated the, the last six months of life, 25% of the cost in uh, healthcare. And we do, I will, I will mention that quality and, and the over uh, testing, over utilization system, uh, stuff. Look for data coming out of the Lown conference. Uh, for those of you who don't never heard of Bernard Lown, uh, one of the premier cardiologists of the last century, he decided we should be using lidocaine and ventricular arrhythmias. He sort of said that we could go ahead and uh, cardiovert people, and he also said that we should be using DC defibrillation. So the AEDs were all named after him, basically. He also won the Nobel Peace Prize. But he has a conference that's going to go on December 3rd, 4th, and 5th. So look for the uh, reports out of that. Uh, they're going to be talking about medical education as one of the components of how do we teach our students, interns, residents, fellows, to get to that next level so they're not looking at we're second to last in cardiology for something up there that, that uh, Dr. Boyd put up. Well, I'm sitting across from the executive director who's a cardiologist, invasive, for the American College of Cardiology. He says, well, you know, people talk about 60% of cardiac caths being completely normal. They're really only 42%. 42%? You got the wrong criteria. Something's going on. Why are we doing 42% tests that have no meaning whatsoever and they shouldn't have been done? Well, we're working on it. We're going to get better criteria. That was his comment. The answer is payment incentives. Okay, we've got five people left standing for questions. We've got 10 minutes, so I suggest you make a short question. We'll have one respondent to each so that everybody gets their turn. Hi, um, my name is Jessica Lim. I'm a first year student here. And my question is more about where exactly is this cost that everyone seems to be talking about? Like we're throwing around this term cost, and is it the cost of the actual procedures, or is it the cost of the doctors, or is it cost of the insurance companies like buying over how much to give dispersed and like whether or not patients need it I'm just not clear on this term cost that seems to be umbrelling the problem let me see if I could make that clear in um, probably 20 years ago there were three administrators for every four doctors now there are five administrators for every one doctor so it's people that are pushing papers around and the insurance industry and the quality review and the fraud detection and all of that um, huge amount of bureaucracy that has increased the cost of medicine and the fact that patients don't particularly care what things cost is the other thing. So I would say that's where it's going. Uh, I, I speak as certifiably the oldest one in the room. <laughs> uh, this place had cows running around it when I was doing general practice two blocks from here in 1960. Uh, how many, may I start by asking a question? How many people in this room have read the Dartmouth Atlas for Healthcare? Well, I would submit that you cannot have this discussion without having read the Dartmouth Atlas and read it once, read it twice, read it three times. And you have to go and I'd like to panel a comment. You have to go from the Dartmouth Atlas to the Institute of Medicine, which got over $19 billion in that bill, ACA. $19 billion. It was a voluntary organization until it got $19 billion. And that flows over into the IPAB, which is going to take everything that comes from 
first the Dartmouth Atlas and passes through the IOM, and the IPAB is going to say, this is the way it's going to be, gang, and if you don't like it, get out of medicine. So it, it's, it's coming. They gave all the goodies up front, and what affects you here, you're all talking about money, but what affects you is really is what you're going to do, what you're going to practice. And it's these three bodies in this bill that are the core of what happened here. I'd like to hear your comment. I, I, you know, it, what's even more frightening about the IPAB, the uh, Independent Payment Advisory uh, Board, is that if Congress doesn't agree on who's on it, then the president gets to pick one person. Well, it's Sibelius already. Uh, anybody they want to sit on that to make decisions about where to save money and how to cut specifically anything that that person wants. If, if the Congress is able to put more people on it, then it can. But it doesn't say anything in there that it would be physicians. The IPAB piece, uh, we try to get out of there as organizations in medicine through for, for, for the entire time that it ever even showed up. And as a matter of fact, the guy that introduced the damn thing was actually fired from the White House and left and yet they're still holding on to that for some crazy reason. It's really, uh, really something. But uh, I couldn't agree with you more that, um, you know, when you deal with health policy, it's very complicated. One thing, you trigger one thing, it affects another. And, and looking at the Dartmouth Atlas studies and, and what they've come up with, how they've looked at things, and the data that they have, it's, it's very important to understand why the thinking in Washington from health policy standpoints have gone to where they have. The, inter the, uh, the IOM is another entity that is uh, uh, quite interesting, and unfortunately, most of the people that sit at the IOM were never practicing physicians uh, in their own right. They were, they were academicians who maybe practiced uh, brief, you know, in some regard within their own confines of the institution that they practiced in. So they never knew what primary care or even even uh, private practice was. So they're the ones helping to decide by writing these papers, uh, with or without input sometimes, uh, with or without public uh, 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 speaking engagements, and they go off and they write these on their own. So, so it is disconcerting to, uh, to look at what you just said and, and see what's uh, potentially coming down the pipe. Hi, good evening. My name is Sharday Chambers. I'm a first year osteopathic medical student here at Rowan SOM. And hopefully I have a very simple question for you. Uh, so my question is, how do you, or what do you think the benefits or the pros and cons would be in integrating medical care more with public health, um, more with the, uh, those in education. Um, more specifically, I'm 100% uh, for looking or assessing my patients, my future patients in four years, from a holistic perspective. You know, so not just assessing them physio physiologically, but looking at the other factors that you know cause the the, the healthcare problems that they have. Um, and for myself personally, I do not hail from a, a, a high socioeconomic background, so I empathize with those who are from an underserved population, who are uninsured and underinsured. Short. And so I know, uh, and I'm, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible, I know Dr. Paul Farmer uh, in his work in Haiti and different countries around the world, he uses community health workers uh, to try to lower or I guess to try to bridge those gaps. And uh, my question to you overall is how do you think that using an integrated system can help our healthcare system? I'm going to direct that to Dr. Thar. Yeah, I think that's really important. It's something that we've forgotten in our in our current legislation. It was forgotten in ACA, and it really has dropped by the wayside. Back in the 60s, we used to have a, a large emphasis on something called community-oriented primary care, which uh, saw the patient in the community, not as just an isolated person who uh, who walks through the door one day, and. Um, uh, we need to uh, reintegrate this concept of community-oriented primary care back into practice. And I think the best place to do that, to begin to do it, is right here in medical schools, is to get students out into the community, uh, into homes, so they understand what's going on there and they understand the interactions of that patient with their environment, which creates a good share of the illness that we see every day in, in our practices. So I, I think it's, uh, it has to be an educational uh, initiative. It has to be something that's reimbursed. 
we, we need to get paid for it. I mean, I, I, the charity care idea is a great thing, but it's, uh, that's probably 2% of what goes on in the country. What we really need is uh, 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 an educational focus, a reimbursement focus, and a, a concept that grows with uh, us as uh, uh, physicians and as students, uh, that we understand this is part of our practice. The uh, community health centers were given several hundred million dollars in the PPACA as well as in two other pieces of legislation that preceded it. Uh, the reason I bring that out is because they also put in their teaching health centers. They, became, they are our community health centers that are now acting as residencies in primary care. So that's new and those are in there. Small, small piece. Yeah. Notice I said a few hundred million. Sounds like a lot, not even close. I didn't say billion. If you don't say billion, it really doesn't mean much. No, and, and a free market would have um, ancillary health people being able to practice at the very top of their, um, their licensing and training. And that's part of that whole integrated community care as well that helps bring down cost. And last but not least tonight, Hello guys, my name is Raul, uh, Raul Patel, first year medical student here at Open SOM. My question is directed to Dr. Thar. You said that universal access would reduce the cost and increase the quality. Uh, the question is how? Uh, can you give, an, uh, give us a small example, how would it work? Well, I think we can see right now, just from the basic statistics we see internationally, our costs are double uh, all the countries that have universal access. And we have comparable quality. Uh, in many cases, we're below the quality of those other countries. That's at the macro level. If we look uh, again at um, uh, continuity of care, which is one of the most important parts that we've actually discussed here today, any time that continuity of care gets interrupted in any way, we, uh, we suffer health care costs as a result of that and uh, more disease and disability for our patients. So we really need to understand that continuity of care, universal access are parts of making the system higher quality, more efficient, and actually lower cost. Other countries have actually shown us that already. So I, I want to answer this question as well. Uh, I agree with that, and I think that uh, the single player system will reduce costs by reducing the administrative um, confusion that occurs with multiple clients. It will do that. Um, exactly how much by it, it's hard to say, but if there was one payment system that everyone adopted, it would be less phone call between companies and to make sure there's pre certification between hospital and the insurer. Something which had to go through all the time um, because someone presents with a study and they can't have it and so on and so I think that in terms of quality, you have to be careful. Uh, you have to be careful because, again, using global metrics to express quality leads to a lot of dilution. Let me give you one example. Um, Oregon just did a Medicaid study, which was published in many a few months yeah. ago, and they randomized people to insurance and non insurance. And believe it or not, it did not improve outcomes. I cannot believe that it did not improve outcomes. It's hard to believe. Um, I think Carl Sagan said extraordinary facts and extraordinary evidence. That's not extraordinary fact at all. If you have, you can see a physician, if you're underserved, you're economically deprived, why would you not have improved outcomes? There are two messages I got from that. Firstly, what you measure as outcomes really does not measure anything. And secondly, to people that come from economically disadvantaged such as society, there's so much outside medical care that impacts on medical care that actually improves outcomes. So I think that using um, life years, using cholesterol levels, uh, aren't reliable metrics. But, uh, as, as a part of mediation, I do think that the single best system will be cheaper than the madness. I would just say I can understand why people on Medicaid might have worse outcomes than people with no insurance, because I've seen it a lot. Especially here in New Jersey, where, again, the payment to the doctor is so low on Medicaid that they just can't find a doctor. And um, there's just not a, uh, there's not a good care. They end up coming to our clinic, we find somebody that has a tongue lesion, we call up an oral surgeon and he does us a favor and helps us and we get the person care. And this happens time and time again. It could happen on a grand scale if 
we had lots of the clinics like ours, if the state simply um, just protected us from malpractice in our private practices, I'm just saying this, it's a law that's actually gonna come um, to be discussed in the New Jersey Senate next month, I hope. And um, so we'll, we'll get to see, and New Jersey will be the crucible to find out if it works. So, so I wanna say this has been a fabulous um, discussion. I would like to explain uh, emphasize that I think this is a very complex issue. Every single time anybody said anything, I had something else I wanted to say back. And I'm sure everybody on this panel felt this way. Um, the idea of having more conversations like this in your school, I think is absolutely essential for you to understand these in depth. None of us have been able to answer to the extent that we know this, the, the information here. And this is just a, these are snippets, these are introductions to what information you need to gain in order to have a better understanding. So I, I, I commend you for participating in this and say thank you very much for the opportunity to have us come up and, and give our little bits and pieces, but it's only bits and pieces and there's a lot more work that needs to be done for you to really understand the complexity of this issue. So go out there and do it, and I hope you guys are great doctors because it's really fun being a doctor. <laughs> I just, just want to refer you to two programs. The first is the TIPS program, and they're both run out of uh, NYIT. Uh, they're health policy programs. The TIPS program is for residents. When you're during your residency, it's called training and policy studies. And then, the health, and then there's a health policy uh, uh, fellowship that they also will give to practicing physicians. In it, they give you training programs. Uh, it starts on a Thursday. It's once a month for a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And uh, they meet in Washington three or four times. They meet on different campuses of the osteopathic uh, medical schools around the country. And uh, their specific uh, program uh, is extremely well received. I believe they're in their 20, maybe fifth year even. Uh, and and it, 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 they're just great programs for future reference. I just want to thank the panel for their participation and passion and information. Thank you everybody for coming out and I just want to thank uh, Dr. Beth Haynes and the Benjamin Rush Institute who without her help we never would have got this off the ground so if you join me in giving uh, Dr. Haynes a round of applause please. I'll turn it over to Nick. Okay, and now here for everyone else uh, to thank. Uh, first of all I'd like to thank our moderator Dr. Boyd uh, for moderating this wonderfully. Uh, I'd like to thank our custodial staff and media department for helping us set up uh, pretty quickly before this all happened, so give them a round. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Dean Machici of Alumni Affairs. He always seems to have a hand in here and helping us out, so. Uh, I'd like to thank Sodexo Catering because they are our provider of food here and they filled us up outside before. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Cavalieri, our dean, um, and all the other deans for uh, having us here. And I'd like to thank all of you, honestly, for coming, taking your time out of your night. You have exams, I understand that, but this is extremely important for our futures as physicians. Uh, so, so thank you all. Hey guys, one more thing. Um, so I want to give a special, actual thanks, special thanks to uh, our panelists here for exposing us to everything we just heard tonight, exposing us to the issues in medicine, exposing us to free market practice, single payer practice, and the ACA. Um, and it was awesome actually to see how much you guys care about this and how many questions we actually all do have. And I hope that whatever we talked about tonight, that it doesn't stop here, that we continue this conversation outside of class, uh, in, in the library. It's important, thanks Jay. Uh, for our futures as physicians, we can study all we want, but in the end, if we have trouble practicing medicine, or trouble delivering, that, trouble delivering that care, it's all for nothing. So thank you so much for coming out. Hope you enjoyed it. See you all later.